morning. It is so wonderful to see you all here worshiping with us this morning here at Gainesville United Methodist Church. My name is Burt Miller, and I'm the youth director. And again, it's just, it's so nice to see you all here in person with your faces and all of that wonderful stuff. Um, before we begin worship this morning, I just wanted to uh, remind you all of a, a couple things coming up. We're going to be continuing our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services, both in person here indoors for the foreseeable future. And also, we will have children's Sunday school, that's pre-K all the way through fifth grade, for both our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. So if you know any young children uh, that you would like to send out to Sunday school, you can do that while you are here. Uh, will you all please stand for our opening hymn this morning, Lift High the Cross. It looks like a church. Could you say amen? amen. Say it a little bit louder. Amen. How about a hallelujah? hallelujah? It sounds like a church. You know what, Benson, I think it is a church. We are a church again. One last thing to get back. One last thing, and pretty soon, Benson and I are going to be able to make the decisions on this and that's a full choir. Right now, we're still restricted to four singers. I don't know what the coronavirus knows. I didn't even know it knew how to count. That if you get to five singers, you've got a risk. But if you stay at four singers, it's all safe. I don't know. We were told originally to limit our indoor worship services to 40 minutes, because I guess at 40 minutes in one second, all the coronavirus goes, attack, attack. We're free, but no, it is so good to see all of you. I missed you so much. Benson missed you, Bert missed you, Patrick missed you, everybody missed you. We're so glad you're back. Let's have a word of prayer as we prepare to listen to Benson's good word for us this morning. Gracious God, you know, I say that out of habit, but I also say that out of need. I'm a broken person who needs the grace of God. 
We all need the grace of God. And so, Lord, as you pour out your word through Benson this morning, as you bring your word to life and to light, open our hearts with your grace to receive your word, to incorporate it, to let it lift us up. We are broken, but you're the healer. Be with my brother Benson. Pour out your spirit upon him. In Christ's name, amen. Now, if, if I can ask you to keep a secret, uh, I'm really glad to be back too. And then this morning it happened and it was our first 8 o'clock service back and I was not quite as happy to be up at that time. But, shh, don't tell them that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have a baby. I'm up at 5 anyways. What's it matter? Sleep does not exist in my life anymore. It's cool, it'll come back sometime. But not why we're here today. Let's jump into the Word. This is from 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. I'm going to start in verse 19. I'm going to read through verse 23. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessing. With praise and thanksgiving, this is the word of God for the people of God, and we all say, thanks be to God. So I, um, I discovered a new annoying habit I've developed, which is always fun. Uh, I have a long list that I'm building up. Uh, but my newest one, my newest one I discovered very recently, this week, at the expense of all of our wonderful staff here at church, uh, is I have a new way of sharing with them. Uh, so I'm, I'm a weird person, just how it is. Uh, and so I love change. So when things start changing, uh, my like engine gets going. I'm like, ooh, this is exciting. I, I know like everybody else is like, I hate change. I don't want anything to do with change. Stay away from me, change. No, not me. Great. So uh, as we're changing and adjusting, figuring out what it means to go back to church, figuring out uh, how we navigate these waters and how we handle it well, and most importantly, like how we stay spiritually grounded and centered on what God wants during this time, uh, I'm super excited. So I have lots of ideas. What I discovered is uh, the way I talk about my ideas is a bit problematic. So I go up to our staff doesn't matter which one you pick. And I say, I have a great idea. And I've realized all of my ideas are now great ideas. I no longer, I don't know when it happened, but I don't have just ideas anymore. I only have great ideas. So here's the problem that then I sort of reflected on, uh, which is now, let's say it's, I don't know, if Janet, plug your ears. Let's say it's not actually a great idea, right? Like, uh, now, not only do they have to argue with me about it, but they're insulting me by saying it's not a great idea, right? Like, I've actually put a new layer uh, on top of my thought to protect it. So if I come up to them, right, and say, hey, I have an idea, they can say, well, I'm not sure that's the best idea, or what if we did something different? If I come up to them and say, I have a great idea, now they have to be like, first of all, it's not that great, and now, why don't we try something different? Like, it's just an unfair spot to put somebody in. I, it reminds me, uh, I worked with a person for a few years, not here, uh, years and years ago, uh, and they had this way of talking, and I don't think they did it on purpose either, but they would always come into my office and they would say this, I know you already know this, but, or I know you already understand, but, and then they would share my, their idea with me. 
So the problem was, and why it was so brilliant, was if I said, I don't understand that, or I didn't know that, I immediately looked dumb, and then it was the opportunity for them to explain to me why they were right. Or if I said, I do know that, and I do understand that, then I was already agreeing with the idea before I even got to talking about the idea. So I have taken that phrase, and I have just shortened it into a single word, great. But I'm essentially doing the exact same thing. The issue is, right, it's actually a horrible way of communicating with people. It, it's unfair to them. It puts them on the back foot. Uh, it, it puts them in a position in which they need to agree with me. And as I was thinking about that, I, I just sort of realized, um, man, isn't that the world we live in today? Like, I, I don't know when I started doing it. I don't know when that person I used to work with picked up the habit. I didn't mean to pick it up. And then I just look around and I say, like, when did we all start communicating or thinking that was how we should communicate with each other? Right? It's this sign, right? This, this problem, this problem we face in the world, which is people do what they want to do, not what they should do. Right? Pe people do, they, they have the right to do something, and so just because they have that right and that's what they want, that's what they do. Without thinking, is that the thing I should do? Is that the way I should communicate? Because when we communicate that way, when we behave in this pattern of I'm just going to do what I want, essentially what we are telling people is, I am here, you need to come to me. I am here, it's your job to come to me. I'm not interested in meeting you where you are. I'm interested in you meeting me where I am. And I think uh, if that way of communicating can so easily weave its way into the church, how much more and I don't think I'm going out on a limb here, is it already pervasive in the ways we communicate and receive information today in our world? And, and the painful part of this, the painful part of this, where you see the brokenness in people, where you see the brokenness in this world, right, is, is it destroys, it destroys relationships. I mean, imagine a relationship with your spouse or uh, with your coworker, with a friend, with someone you care about, in which the relationship existed by communicating with each other in a way that says, here's what I'm doing, here's where I stand, here's what I think, and you, got, you can either come to me or not. Like, what, which, what relationship do we have in our lives that would s survive such a thing? I mean, my relationship with my dog doesn't even work that way. Like, when I, when I get mad at my dog, and I'm usually right, by the way, uh, and he knows he's in trouble, he doesn't even come to me. He just lays down right where he is. He does not know the command lay down. He just does it because he knows he doesn't want to come over here. Right, like, so if, if I can't even communicate that way with a dog, why do I think I can communicate that way with my wife, with my staff, with my friends, with the congregation, with people I care about, with my family? Like, it breaks relationships. And not only does it break relationships, and, and we all need to hear this, like, it can destroy a church. I've always wanted to do something, and let me be clear before I jump into this. I love being here. I want to stay here. I'm not going to do this here. Great. At some point in my life, let's say I'm not here. Again, I want to be here. I want to stay here. I like being here. Let's say I'm not here. Or maybe I just like go off and take a sabbatical and I'm at another church for a month or something. I want to try this thing. I know it's going to destroy a church, which is why, again, I don't want to do it here and won't do it here. 
I just want to say yes. I want to say yes to everybody. Every person that calls with an idea or a thought, I just want to say yes. Right? So when the person says, calls up, says, hey, uh, I, it would just be great if you preached for an hour straight. I want to say, great, I'll preach for an hour straight. And then that Sunday, I want to preach for an hour straight, and then people are mad at me, and they say, man, that service went really long. Uh, can, can, can we keep the service to an hour? And I'll say, yeah, let's keep the service to an hour. And then someone will say, I wish we sang more hymns. Like, how about we sing five hymns? I'll just say, yeah, let's just sing five hymns. Janet, do not ask me, right? Uh, <laughs> and they say, let's just sing five hymns. I'll say, yeah, sure, we'll just sing five hymns. You know, I want, let's do communion every week. Okay, we'll just do communion every week. And the next time, can we stop singing so many hymns? Yeah, sure, we won't sing any more hymns. Like, if we just said yes to everything, everybody calls, because they're just like, oh, can we do this? This is what I want. Uh, everything would change so dramatically, so constantly. We would all be in such fights with each other. Again, I don't want to try this here, and I'm not going to try it here. I just have this thought, if it happened, it would be shocking. It would be shocking how much we, with good intention, can communicate in such a way of, this is what I want, I have the right to ask it, so I want it done. Opposed to thinking. Even though I could do this, what should I do? Because the thing is, when we destroy, when we allow communicating like this to destroy the church, what we're ultimately doing is we're destroying people's relationships with God. We're destroying our own relationships with God. I mean, the things, the things that some of us churchgoers can get upset about and leave a church for. What upsets me is not about people's different passions and whether they're right or wrong. It upsets me knowing that when someone walks out the doors of a church, they're walking away from a beautiful relationship with the Lord. And so Paul understands this. Like, There's this beautiful thing where he's, as he's writing to the church in Corinth, he spends chapter after chapter actually talking about church unity, and I think the better word there for us is community. And he sees that, that this is happening, right? It's happening in the church. And so there's this beautiful just healing balm in scripture for us in, in this book. And so I just want to read it again. Paul says it this way. I have become all things to all people that I might, by all means, save some. He says, to the weak, I became weak so that I might win the weak. And I just, I love, I love what Paul says here. I love how Paul realizes, right, that the way to actually connect with people, the way to actually meet people, the way to actually engage in people, the way to actually build connections and relationships and community with people is not by saying, I am strong, I am right, here's my great idea, get over here. It's to say, I am weak, you are weak, let me actually share my weakness, and in my weakness, we actually build this community. I mean, we live in a world, right, that does not communicate weakness. It communicates strength, it communicates rightness. It communicates power. And I just want to point out, I don't care how you feel about anything, but if that was a great way of doing things, why does one half of the country hate the other half of the country? Just doesn't seem to be going very well. So maybe Paul, maybe I don't know the almighty, all-knowing God, is on to something in his word when he realizes, when Paul realizes through God, puts in the scriptures, God makes it his word. Huh. Maybe I stop playing the power card. Maybe I stop playing the right card. And I start engaging in our weaknesses. Because the reality is, uh, when I walked in these doors this morning, 
a broken person came to church. When, when you walk through those doors this morning, broken people came to church. And I just find myself thinking, if we stop trying to put on the mask of how we have it together or how we're always right or how we know everything, and we start instead saying, like, man, at the baseline, we are all people, and we are all broken. What an instantaneous connection point we have with each other. What a way to look at somebody and say, I'm no better than you, so why am I asking you to always come to me? Maybe the thing I should be doing, as Paul says, to the weak I became weak. I became all things to all people that I might reach them. But then Paul says this, really good wording here. He doesn't just say, I should become all things to all people. He says, I should become all things to all people that by all means, I might save some. See, the second thing that he's on to in this, in this healing is he's realized to not look for the guarantee, but to look for the possibility. He doesn't say, I became all things to all people by all means so that I can save everybody. He doesn't even say he's saving a single person. He doesn't even say he's connecting with a single person. He just says that he might save some people, that he might reach some people, that he might connect to some people. Because what he understands, what God's word teaches us, Right? Is that the guarantee is never actually there. It's always the possibility that contains more. The problem is, like, we as people, like, man, we love a guarantee. <laughs> like, love a guarantee. Right? We, we just want that simple way of just saying, okay, just tell me the right thing to do. That's what I'm going to do. Done. Moving on. But the thing is, that doesn't actually even exist. There was a season of life when Alicia and I, we were first married, and I have no clue why this happened, but we kept being asked to speak to either like young moms groups or young dads groups or young married couples or engaged couples at like premarital workshops. And they always wanted to ask us about our marriage, which again, we were married for like a year at this point. I was like, I don't think I have that much to share, but here I am. Uh, <laughs> and so, Every single one of these things we did, we got the same question. What do you do, Benson, to be romantic and to show your love for Alicia? I said, you don't want the answer to that question. Which, of course, I was like, no, no, I need the answer. And then Alicia would be like, you do not want the answer to that question. Oh, no, please, please tell us the answer. I said, you are not going to like the answer to that question. Like, it, we don't need to go through it. No, 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 please tell us the answer. Okay. So I tell them exactly what I do when I want to like, be a grand romantic gesture for my wife. I vacuum the house, leaving perfect carpet lines, and I do the dishes. I'm not kidding. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. And that's the key to a healthy marriage. Carpet lines. Um, you know, that's so cool. Anyways. <laughs> so I'm like, what? I'm like, that's not really romantic. I'm like, I'm sorry. You're the one who asked me what I do for my wife. Like, why are we now arguing with my answer? So then, of course, someone always says, like, don't you give her chocolate? No, my wife doesn't like, like chocolate. Why would I give her chocolate? Well, I'm sure you bring her flowers. And I'm like, listen, my wife is allergic to everything known to mankind. Why would I give her flowers? Right, like, hey, honey, I love you. Here's a bunch of roses have a sweet sinus infection, right? Like, again, this is my other thing, right? Like, you're the ones asking me the question. I'm telling you what I'm doing. It didn't meet what you had in your head was the guarantee. Because you didn't stop to think, we're all different. There is no single solution to this. I mean, think about parents or uh, well, grandparents don't have to worry about this. My 
parents were just in town, and I was like, oh my gosh, y'all are the worst grandparents in the world. You've destroyed every good habit I've taught this baby. But anyways, right? But like, parents, parents, right, are like when you hit the teenage years with your kids, so I'm told, right? It's like, I just want the thing to tell them to, so they'll do exactly what I want them to do. You know? Can I just read the parenting book that guarantees my kids a productive member of society? And it's like, guess what? That's not there. Like, there are no guarantees in life. And so Paul, when he's looking at, like, how do I connect with people? How do I heal these relationships? How do I heal my church, which is just fracturing and breaking apart? How do I actually build this thing called community? He realizes there's no guaranteed way to do it. The only way to do it is actually to see the possibility in each and every single person. And so he's not concerned with saying, you have to do this, 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 and this, and then you're done, right? Because what's that going right back to? It's going back to saying, here's my great idea, now do it my way. And so he takes the opposite approach. And he says, why don't I just try it on and see if it works on a couple of people? Like we have to pursue the possibility over chasing a non-existent guarantee. We need to look at the people around us, and as we see that common ground, stop saying, meet me where I am, but make the decision to meet them where they are. Because I will tell you this, uh, there there is one great idea. It's a very great idea, actually. Probably the best idea I've ever heard. Uh, And it's not mine. (laughs) Shocking. Shocking. but I'm really glad God had the idea to meet me where I was. You know? Like, I'm really glad. I'm really glad that God had the idea to meet each and every single one of us right where we are. Like, I can't tell you how grateful and blessed and moved I am. when I think about myself, when I think about our church, when I think about all of you, that God didn't say, hey, you have to find a way to me. He said, for the weak I became weak and took on human flesh and to all people I became all things by all means. So he went to a cross because he was interested in meeting me and you and all of us exactly where we are. As I just think about that, I can't think of a greater action or relationship that's made a bigger impact on my life. So maybe God was onto something there. And the fact each and every time I screw up, each and every time I get a little cocky and think all my ideas are great, each and every time you or I stumble or make a mistake, God doesn't say, you have to come chase me down. He says, I'll just meet you right where you are. I'll just meet you right where you are. Just keeps pouring out goodness and grace and meeting us where we are in our And so maybe this morning you've just never even realized God was there to meet you. Maybe this morning as you come back to church, as we all rediscover the joy of worshiping together, maybe you just need to be reminded that like God's just going to meet you right where you are. Or maybe you think about the people in your neighborhood, your grocery stores, the offices, work, your communities, your bunco groups, whatever it is. And you think, man, God is meeting these people right where they are. God wants to meet these people right where they are. And I don't know about you, but I'm just so blessed by that. And I'm so grateful in a world where people just so desperately want to be right. 
want everyone on their side. That I worship and follow a God who does anything but that. And praise be to Jesus for that. Praise be to Jesus. If you would pray with me. Lord, I just thank you for your goodness. I thank you for our church. I thank you for each and every single person gathered here. What a joy it is to worship you with imperfect people as an imperfect person. What a joy it is to connect and be able to say, hey, we don't have it all together. And yet each and every single one of us is a recipient of your grace. What a beautiful thing to hold in common. What a beautiful thing to connect over. So I praise you, Lord. I praise you for your infinite wisdom, for your work on a cross, for being willing to meet us exactly where we are. I just praise you for that, Lord. And I pray that that goodness and that truth Lord, it wouldn't just sit in our hearts this morning. But it would re-energize us. Maybe we would accept it for the first time. Maybe we accept it anew. And it would just fuel us and fill us. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. I want to help you out with something, Benson. You're talking about your parents being the worst grandparents in the world. But I, I want to help you out with this. If you haven't turned 50 yet, 
when you do, within a day of the year that you turn 50, AARP starts calling. You get letters, you get pamphlets, you get notifications. The year that you turn 65, all of a sudden, Medicare sends you something every week. Here's where you can sign up. When you have the announcement of that first grandchild, and I know this because we have two on the way, you get a booklet, actually it's a small book, in the mail, and it says, the title of it is, How to Spoil That Kid Rotten and Then Give Him Back. It's a booklet that you get when you become a grandparent. So your parents got it, they read it, they know it. So kudos to them. So I just wanted to help you out with that life lesson. Um, folks, as we come to communion time, uh, I do want to ask you to be very careful with these. There is a thin film on top that you pull back to get to the wafer, to the bread, and then the larger tab is for the juice. Do not tug on that juice too hard, especially if you're wearing white, because a blob of that juice will come jumping out at you and get on your clothes. We don't want you to not come back to church. I went to church on Communion Sunday, and they were using these strange little containers with the juice and the wafer, and I got it all over myself, and I had this big cleaning bill. I'm not going back to that church. Now, just be very careful. In fact, I found in doing this, you don't have to pull it all the way back to be able to take and receive the juice, okay? So that's just a little warning on these. As we prepare our hearts, I want to use something from Benson's sermon. The penultimate moment of Jesus coming to us in our brokenness was shown in the upper room. John's Gospel says at the very beginning of the 13th chapter, and Jesus, knowing all that was going to take place, went into the upper room with those disciples. He knew about the betrayal. He knew about the denial. He knew about the running away. Instead of him looking at those disciples as he broke the bread and held up that cup and saying, you're a bunch of scum. Look what you're going to do to me. He went to them in their brokenness. And he said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Jesus didn't make them come to him. He went to where they were, and they were in a pretty broken state. And so as we prepare our hearts, remembering the words of Jesus when he said, this is my body broken for you. No matter how broken you might be this morning, he wants to come to you. The only thing that holds him back is you. Let's bow our hearts and heads in prayer. Lord, remind us as we receive the elements this morning that no matter how broken we might be, you still will come to us. You'll come to draw us to you, to begin the healing process of our brokenness. And so, Lord, we give you our praise, we give you our thanks, we give you our love this morning because of that promise of coming to us. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, and he raised it, and he gave thanks, and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many all of us for the forgiveness of our sins. Drink from this, all of you. And so as we prepare to take communion together, we do those things. We remember we are Christ's body, and remember his blood has been shed for us. We are doing things a little bit different this morning, uh, but the ushers will assist you in coming forward. You'll receive one of these communion uh, containers from John or I. You'll then go back to your seat, and then we will all uh, take the bread, and then drink the juice together. If you would bow your heads and pray with me. Almighty God, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ. Lord, that redeemed by your blood, we would be your body 
in service to this world. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. This is the body of Christ which is broken for you. Take. Thank you for this meal. Thank you for this opportunity to meet us right where we are and to pour your grace into our lives. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. As wonderful as it is to have everyone back here, we wanted to remind you of some of the uh, events and uh, offerings that are happening over this upcoming summer, uh, just to get everybody plugged back in after this year and a half of feeling so separated from one another. Uh, I mentioned before that both the 9.30 and 11 o'clock services will be having Sunday school. Um, we are also going to be hosting our Vacation Bible School the week of July 12th. Um, if you have any kids that you would like to sign up for that, uh, sign-ups are currently on the church website. There's a password 
uh, to sign up your kids because we're wanting to make sure that all of the kids of church members here have uh, the, the first crack at it because we have a specific limit for how many students that we can take for VBS this year. Uh, that password is submarine. Um, but you'll see that on the, uh, the email that went out. If you uh, would be interested as an adult to help out with either Vacation Bible School or Sunday School on Sunday mornings, please reach out to uh, either Renee or Carrie, our Christian Education Directors. They would love to speak with you because uh, we could uh, very much use uh, a bit of help with those things this summer. Uh, we'd also like to mention that we're going to be holding uh, a number of one-off events uh, on Friday evenings this summer, whether those be uh, family movie nights or multi-generational trivia nights uh, here at the church. We're, just, we're having an offering of uh, just some fun, laid-back uh, community events. Uh, we'll have the full calendar for all of those summer events coming up this week. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. We would love to see you out there for movie and trivia nights. And folks, just to add some spice to what Bert just said, Bert is the trivia master. The man has a knowledge across a wide range of subjects. It's just amazing. There's a calendar in the office, and he and Bernadette, they do this every week or so. They'll go through all the things, and his amazing knowledge of trivia is fantastic. Now, what we want to do is we want to have a stump Bert night. Okay, now, normally Bert is going to write the questions, so it's going to be pretty hard to stump him. But we're going to get some folks together to write questions to stump Bert. You want to come out for this. It's going to be fun. And guess what? It's community. It's fellowship. It's coming to be together. And that's what we've missed for 15 months. I really don't know all that much. It's, just, it's a lot of useless information. He's got eclectic trash, but he, he knows a lot. Will you all please stand for our closing hymn this morning, I Love to Tell the Story, verses 1, 2, and 4.
if you uh, are new amongst our community here at Gainesville Church, we are so glad that you joined us uh, this morning. And my prayer, our prayer, is just that in a song, in a joke from Pastor John, in something I said, in a prayer that you have just connected with God and felt the Spirit this morning. We would love to connect with you more. Uh, we're still doing things a bit differently, but our Connections Director, Samantha Allen, will be out in the lobby at the table uh, to my right. Uh, when you leave, we'd love for you to take some time just to talk to her so we can get to know you better and get you plugged in. And uh, if you did bring your offering with you this morning and have not already um, done so but are wondering what to do with it, we have two um, podium stands in the uh, lobby where you can place that. Finally, sorry for all the housekeeping, uh, if you would just take your communion container with you, there are two trash bins in the back. I feel like a flight attendant right now. Uh, there are two trash cans, uh, trash bins in the back. If you could just throw those away for us, that would be great. Here's the good news. God met you right where you are. God sees the possibility in you and in those around you. And so go into this world filled with grace, filled with God's goodness as a witness to those around you, meeting them where they are, so that we all together can discover the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. Go in peace in the name of Jesus.